Please welcome to the stage Caitlin Owens of Axios, Dr. Susan Harvey of Hologic, Dr. Leah Tedessa Gabramandine of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and Her Excellency Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic of the Republic of Croatia. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Owens. I'm a reporter at Axios. I cover healthcare. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion on driving action to improve global women's health through data. I'm really excited for our discussion today. And let's do, I'll do a quick introduction of our panelists, and we'll jump right into it. Um, right here, we have Dr. Susan Harvey. She's the Vice President of Worldwide Medical Affairs at Hologic. Right here, we have Dr. Leah Tedesi the Health Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. And then finally, we have H.E. Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic, the former president of the Republic of Croatia. Join me in welcoming all of these panelists, please. So Dr. Harvey is going to begin our discussion today with an overview of Hologic's um, Global Women's Health Index data from 2021, and then we'll discuss the findings among all of our panelists. Dr. Harvey. Thank you, Kaylin, and I want to thank Concordia for setting up this important convening meeting. Kaylin, you for running the panel, and your excellencies, we're grateful for your presence in this discussion about women's health. On Wednesday, we will unveil the second year of data from the Hologic Global <coughs> Women's Health Index for 2021. This is the world's largest study of women's health experiences. What we know at Hologic is you must measure something to be able to impact it and improve it. And our partnership with Gallup allows us to speak with women around the world and measure women's health. This is so critical because women are the foundations of families, communities, and economies. Just some quick highlights of the 2021 data. 1.5 billion women did not have access to preventive care. That is more than the population of China. As a healthcare provider in breast cancer for decades, it's very clear to me how critically important the detection of deadly diseases early can be for life expectancy and quality. Another finding that we noted was the gap between high income and low income countries continue to increase. There was a twofold increase in this gap. Disparities and inequities are getting larger. Women's health at its best is stagnant and it's worsening in many regions of the world. The data has shown us that there are five comprehensive dimensions of health, which explain 80% of the variation in women's life expectancy. In addition, these five dimensions are a framework for actionable policies. The data is sobering and getting worse. And the next steps are that we need to convene and work together to begin to find solutions and improve women's health. Dr. Thank Harvey, you. can you begin with going over what those five different measures are? Um, and then from there, talk about what are some of the biggest areas, areas of gender discrepancy that we're seeing in this data set that you've collected? Great, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So the five dimensions of health are preventive care, basic needs, emotional health, individual health, meaning questions about chronic disease and pain, and then opinions about health and safety. They're weighted differently, and preventive care is weighted most highly in those five dimensions. When we did the survey with Gallup, our partners, we interviewed both men and women. The index is solely the data from women, but the ability to interview men and women gives us insight into gender gaps. Mm -hmm. The gender gaps 
include basic needs. Mm -hmm. Women have greater food insecurity than men. There are also gender gaps in how safe women feel and what the perceptions are. There are gender gaps in understanding the quality of care, including pregnancy care. Mm -hmm. And it's important to think about gender gaps because often, not always, but often men are leading and are policy makers. So we need to understand where the gaps are and how we will address women's health issues as well. And as I said, we're so excited to have these women leaders with us today. Um, ladies, I was just, you know, we're kind of hearing about these big picture data trends from Dr. Harvey. I would love to hear from each of you how you're seeing these gender discrepancies um, and disparities play out in your own countries. Um, and, you know, I know we talked about a lot of different areas here, but um, whatever comes to mind is fair play. And we can drill down from there. Dr. Tedeschi. Thank you so much. And, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be in this panel talking about this important uh, topic and also really thank the Hologic for this uh, index. Uh, I have seen the results also for my country and it's uh, around 54, which is the average, but still very low. As a country, we've been uh, investing a lot in uh, women's health, prioritizing women's health with a focus on the prevention and health promotion. And um, we have a large community health program which focuses on uh, really reaching families, particularly women, through so our women, um, predominantly women health extension workers who uh, provide uh, preventative and promotion, but some basic essential services to women. And this has brought a significant shift in the mortality of uh, maternal mortality mm -hmm. in the past two decades. But still, we are one of the countries still with highest, we've had a 72% reduction in 20 years of the mortality, but still uh, our uh, mortality of uh, mothers is still, is still high. But access has been progressively improving in terms of uh, family planning, uh, maternal I mean, skill, skill delivery, uh, antenatal care, and other uh, key uh, uh, integrated care that we are focusing on the primary level. However, the disparities are still high, even within country. I mean, we have still high mortality as a country, but even within country, we have equity gaps uh, in terms of uh, where women live or the socioeconomic status or other factors. Mm -hmm. But considering that there's also progress we are uh, doing in terms of uh, access, we've been trying to uh, focus on quality of the services women uh, get. But uh, that has been also one of the key challenges, and as you mentioned, that, that's one of the key issues that measurements is always difficult. Mm. And uh, recently we have started some push patient voices survey uh, into, to get the experiences in this regard. But when we talk of women's health, even if I'm uh, primarily talking about the majority of the priorities like maternal mortality related to uh, birth, there are other several women health issues that are impacting women's health, like cancer, uh, cervical and breast cancer are the highest in our country, and we're trying to expand screening programs. Very few uh, women are accessing at this point, but progressively we have now around 1,200 uh, facilities giving VIA and cryotherapy for cervical cancer. So it's a slow progress, but the, the, the disparity is huge. So it requires really uh, critical investments in, in, in health, improving both government and um, other stakeholders and donors' investment in primary care and also um, in other levels of care to really narrow this gap. So the, the disparity is still huge. Thank you. And uh, what about a view from the ground in Croatia? Thank you. Yes, I, um, I have been coming to New York in various capacities, um, including as um, former president of Croatia. And every year we talk um, here about uh, fulfilling Agenda 2030, sustainable development goals for the humankind. And one of the cutting issues over all the sustainable development goals is certainly gender equality and the rights of girls and women. And one of the areas where 
Um, unfortunately, we see a lot of gender discrepancy and it is getting worse. I think that we're getting further away from fulfilling uh, the SDGs rather than closer is women's health, um, health care around the world. Of course, that has been made more complicated by the pandemic, uh, by instability and wars around the world, not just in Europe, but in many other parts of the world. But the pandemic has really set us back so far. Um, we've made uh, several huge steps back, and I think that probably the area where we will see that the, the, the data will demonstrate it is women's health, preventive care, but other areas of, as well. First of all, women were disproportionately um, affected by the pandemic as uh, first responders um, in the medical care, but elsewhere as well. But also in the, those areas such as services where they were more exposed to the virus and, and uh, potential uh, contagion without uh, proper uh, measures that would allow for them to take care of themselves, without proper health care, and without, I would say, proper understanding, not just from employers, but from the governments and from wider communities. And that is also visible in the way that we have been dealing with the pandemic, is when you set up these different government or intergovernmental bodies who uh, look at the measures, um, who look at the finances, how to um, deal with the pandemic, from health to social to other issues, you mostly have men on those panels. Mm. And, and I will be the first person who will not divide people into men and women, et cetera. But there are some aspects, especially of healthcare, that we as women are much more uh, aware of than with all due respect uh, to those men who really take an active part. So looking at Croatia's experience for the past couple of years, again, um, disproportionate, uh, effects on women, uh, the socioeconomic divide has also, the, the gap is getting wider. Uh, women mostly stay at home to take care of other uh, members of the family. In other countries, Croatia not so much, but in, uh, in many other developing countries, girls leave school to stay at home and take care of other family members, um, access to health care, but access to uh, sanitary conditions, access to a living space that would be permanent or at least semi-permanent for women. That is all an issue in, in most of the developing countries. And also exposure due to climate change and the toxic substances uh, at home and the fact that while living at home you have all of these problems and then compounded. Uh, by the quality of the digital devices, uh, the quality of your internet access, the number of those devices, devices, and then women are always sidelined. The same comes to care and preventive care. I have parents, um, one of my uh, parents, my father um, had um, stomach cancer, and I am really afraid of what the prognosis will be because for months, he was not able to get the proper care. And with preventive care, we focus so much uh, on uh, the uh, uh, pandemic that we forgot to teach um, girls and others how to take care of themselves, um, how to uh, have self-examinations, to go uh, regularly at least uh, once uh, a year for these preventive checkups. So this is, um, I'm, I'm afraid it will show in, uh, the, in the rise incidence of chronic diseases, in particular cancer. Uh, another aspect is also just a typically female experience is the childbirth. And uh, the care, uh, the preventive care, getting through the pregnancy, um, the experience of childbirth, which was in, in a locked up situation where fathers or partners or, or family members were not even allowed to be there, which I think contributed to the mental well-being and the postpartum depression and everything else that went with it. And the number of preventative um, healthcare checkups before that was also heavily reduced. And let alone, you know, in Zagreb, in the midst of the pandemic, we also had an earthquake that literally drew all the patients from hospitals into the parking lots and women were, were giving birth 
in the cars, in the parking lot. So a traumatic experience. Mental health, another issue, especially with those family members who lived with abusers. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're only just going to learn about the level of abuse that they were exposed to. And with it will come also substance abuse by the family members who uh, had already been uh, using substances. But I, I would dare say also a number of women who would resort to those substances just to make their lives easier temporarily. And we did not have, we did not set up these safety and security mechanisms, not enough for them to be able to call in for someone to take care of the family situation and, and uh, help people either by removing them physically from an abusive situation or extending a psychological counseling. I, just to, to conclude this, I also um, took the time to talk to a number of very talented young ladies who um, are uh, uh, university students. And um, I saw that probably 80 to 90% of them were so affected by the pandemic that they lost that self-confidence and they were having social issues, social anxiety of even getting out into an open space, going to a store, and a lot of them told me, I have a feeling that people are staring at me, et cetera. So I am afraid that the, that the past couple of years have, we will just uh, begin to see uh, what kind of effect they uh, have left on the situation in healthcare. And uh, I think that the hard data is the best way to tell governments and to tell still mostly male-dominated uh, decision bodies, look, this is the hard data, so obviously we have to do something in order to remedy the situation. And just some of what you were talking about there. Um, one thing I love about Hologic's data set is that it measures um, well beyond physical health care, so preventative care, childbirth. You know, it measured things like emotional well-being and um, feelings of safety. Um, Dr. Harvey, can you go a little bit deeper into what some of those findings were and the kind of holistic nature of what the survey found? Yes, and, and you're so right. All of those five dimensions are intertwined. They really can't be separated. For example, with basic needs, 37% of women around the world told us they have food insecurity. If you're not sure where the next meal is coming from for yourself and your family, you can't prioritize health care. It completely shifts where your focus is. Emotional health measured in 2021, lower than 2020, and the lowest that has been seen in over a decade. It, we are in an emotional health crisis as it's going on in regards to preventive care. Women aren't getting their blood pressure checked. Cancer screening, only 12% of women in the world report cancer screening. That's two billion women who did not get cancer screening. Diabetes, it's the sixth largest and the fastest growing killer of women. And sexually transmitted infections and diseases, which includes the HPV viral testing related to cervical cancer. You've mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We need to keep measuring so we can understand where we are in regards to those development goals and how we can improve. The news is sobering, for sure. Uh, yet, I think we also have to be optimistic that we do have a framework. And if we can prioritize women's health within the resources that are available in each country and region, an improvement in just one of the dimensions can improve the quality of women's lives and ultimately life expectancy. There's a lot of work to be done. Dr. Tedesi, you have been talking about um, some of the improvements that you have seen in Ethiopia. Can you talk about some lessons learned and how um, some of those lessons can be applied across the world? Yes, thank you. Uh, so when we talk about access and, and why women are not 
for example, getting those services. Of course, one is when the services are not available, but even when you provide those the services, there are other barriers that we need to really think of holistically when we think of improving access uh, to quality care. And one, for example, is finances. So uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that women will go and get the care they need if the services are available close to them, but those barriers like finances should be considered. So one of the lessons we have now is we have introduced a community-based health insurance system uh, for the informal sector, which is the largest por uh, proportion in our, in our uh, case, in our country, and it has significantly improved the utilization of services. But particularly for women, it has also improved their empowerment because they now have the, the uh, they don't need to ask for money uh, from their spouses to go and get care because they are insured. So they can't go and get the access. So those are some of the things we need to think of. But also, in terms of services, uh, also we need to think of what would empower women more in terms of uh, getting care. We are yet starting testing it, but for example, self-injectable family planning methods are uh, something we are looking into to improve access to family planning uh, contraceptives, uh, which is because there are different barriers in addition to uh, really access. Of course, in terms of the access, we have tried to uh, make sure that the community has workers who are uh, intentionally made to be women who go to the house to house and talk to the women in the households uh, to and provide those services has significantly improved our family planning, our contraceptive prevalence rate. So uh, a strong community health system is, is one of the key foundations we have learned that needs to be scaled and this community has workers uh, also in our case are one of the few countries who are in government payroll. So the community health workers, which is a large number for around 40,000 of them, who are, who are closely working with the communities in, uh, that they live in, providing care uh, close to the community, they are in government payroll. So it's not a voluntary based service, so it's consistent and progressively we're trying to improve it. So that has been one of the key factors, but even beyond that, we need to look on other ways to really empower uh, women to get the care they need in terms of other uh, uh, options like self-care as well. And maybe one last thing I want to say is uh, one key point we have seen, particularly in these challenging times of the pandemic, but also other challenges in many of our countries like conflict is the issue of gender-based violence, mm. which also has a, a, a role, an impact on, on the women's health. So, uh, it requires a strong uh, multi-sectoral coordination to really address from the prevention to um, the care and treatment and rehabilitation of it beyond even the health sector, which requires holistic approach. And uh, I think when we think overall of women's health, integrated health care, especially at the primary care level, is something crucial we need to think of because we cannot expect women to come for every single uh, different problems they have because once we, they are available in those health facilities, we need to address as much as possible as uh, holistically uh, in primary care. And with the last couple minutes that we have, um, you've just, he, you, the word empowerment, we need to empower women kept coming up. You've talked about how oftentimes, in, you know, the sad irony is women's health issues aren't being discussed by women in leadership positions, um, especially at the governmental level. So. Um, what is the path forward there? How do we make sure that, you know, as a global society, these issues are kept front and center? Absolutely. I mean, this, is, this is a crucial point because I think what we as women in leadership anywhere have to do is, you know, make um, an example ourselves. The power of personal example is so important. And of course, we all want to keep our health issues private, et cetera. But I also made a point as president that I would make it public whenever I took my annual um, preventative care tests, even though that some people didn't um, like to hear the names of some of those tests. 
Uh, unfortunately, there is too much ideology that has penetrated healthcare and healthcare issues. And I, by that, I don't mean just family planning. We've seen this with the pandemic, with vaccination. One of the things that I do also is I'm a women political leaders, um, global ambassador for vaccination, not just for COVID, but for um, the vaccine preventable diseases in general. And it's just incredible what kind of debate you get into, but you have to take a stand. Right. And of course, you have to encourage science and the scientific community to put forward the data. But also speaking about the power of personal example, I also told everybody in Croatia, I had both my children, both my girl and my boy vaccinated against HPV mm -hmm. uh, because I believe it's the right thing to do. And boys, of course, don't get it, but they transmit it. So the responsible thing to do is to not just protect yourself, but to protect others as well. Thank you so much. We're out of time, but all three of you gave us such um, invaluable insight and uh, analysis of the data. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on this really important subject. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.